Um, thank you for joining us today for the update about generative AI at Clarivate. Um, I'm not a soft climb. I'm very sorry for those of you who are expecting to see us off. I am shorter and not from Cleveland, but I'm going to do my very best to give you an update on what we're doing across Clarivate um, with regard to generative AI, rooted very much in an academic approach. It's been really interesting over the last year to see the shift in the way that people are approaching generative um, AI in academic settings. If you think back to where we were around the time of this conference last year, it was right around the time that ChatGPT went live for the general public. And there was so much trepidation, a lot of really outright fear. Of course, there are still concerns, but it's been very interesting to see in the last several months a real shift away from, oh no, what is this? How do we stop it? To how do we use this? How do we put this in place in the classroom in a way that's appropriate? Are there ways we could be teaching with this? Is this something that actually does us a service or could be positioned as a service instead of we need to be afraid of this thing? I think that in libraries, and I know I'm speaking to a library audience, not everything I have to share today really is strictly library centric, but I think in libraries we're often at the forefront of these shifts in technology and in the way that our users use technology. They are frequently out ahead of where we are in our own understanding of technology. And if you think back to whenever you first got involved in library work, there was probably something that was out there that people were saying, such and such a thing is going to be the end of reference, or it's going to be the end of print, or um, you know, Kindles will kill the library, or something like that. I mean, I can think of what those things were when I was first getting involved in libraries. But we've learned to work with them. We have learned that the way that we approach technology as librarians is something that we can incorporate into library work rather than having it be a threat. We've adapted to the world around us. So we're seeing that very much in the way that academic institutions are working with generative AI right at this moment. And this is something that evolves pretty much day by day in terms of how we're approaching this in our institutions. Trying to balance the things that are real legitimate concerns and, and yes, possible threats with the potential benefits to research, to teaching and learning, to exposing our students to new ideas, getting things into the classroom where they can learn to use them in a constructive way before they get out into graduate school or the workplace or what have you. Um, so we're seeing this real shift and I think the things are not settled. We're at a very interesting moment where where this lands has not yet um, been decided. I want to speak about how we are approaching generative AI across Clarivate. We're working with a set of guiding principles and a unified approach to what we're doing with this technology so that we can provide you with services that really make sense, that add value, <laughs> that bring something to the table that maybe isn't in place somewhere else. So this is happening in three um, critical ways. We are working to advance existing services. We are, in some cases, introducing completely new solutions things that are being built out of whole cloth that we're working on. These are a little bit further out in the roadmap in many cases, but we're working on this as well. And we're also looking at tools and processes that can increase productivity and efficiency. This is something that maybe doesn't sound quite as flashy, but I think it's really cool. I'm very excited about this. If you think about the ways that we could use AI to clean up metadata, to make search more efficient for something like our own product knowledge bases. If you're looking for something and the metadata surrounding it is better, it's more uniform, it's easier to use, that makes your work faster and that means that you can help your patrons faster. So I think this is an incredibly exciting area, but it's maybe not the one that always gets the most play when we think about AI in academia, but you know, come talk to me about it. I'm, I'm very excited about it using AI to, uh, to get better metadata, among other things. If we get, dig into a little bit more detail around what does this look like exactly, so those three pillars from the previous slide, there are a couple of different buckets that <coughs> falls into, as we've said. 
product enhancements. So this is existing products where we are enhancing them using artificial intelligence capability. We'll see some of this in a little bit more detail, but some of what we're working on at the moment, um, there's a new AI research assistant that's in beta for Web of Science, conversational discovery going on on the ProQuest platform, um, as well as in Primo, that's the library AI discovery assistant, a research assistant for eBook Central data, and we're very excited that we're now working with a new student engagement tool called Aletheia that works with course materials and, um, and textbooks and things like that to help students through the reading process for their classes. We're building a generative AI platform that will sit underneath all of this and it will allow us to accelerate the delivery of new use cases and new products across the platform to be working from a uniform infrastructure. That will also introduce cross-product capabilities. Some of the things that we know from our own research are very important to users, like being able to summarize an article or some other kind of academic material. That is part of what's being worked on with the platform. Tools having to do with subject classification that can help us to understand what something is about and how to direct the user based on that. Um, and of course, suggestions and the conversational discovery. This will undergird everything that we're doing with the product enhancements. Um, also, the third um, group of things here, or the third bucket, the community experience and process efficiency area has a lot to do with metadata enhancement, better tools for metadata creation, natural language access, as I mentioned, to things like our knowledge base that a lot of you use on a day-to-day -day basis to find information about the product. So this is um, something that we're working on quite actively. You may have seen that we have a new partnership with AI21, an AI company that is helping us to build the platform. We think that this will allow us to move more quickly and to be more agile in the future. I do think it's very important that we take a moment to talk about some of the principles that we're working with here and the commitments that we've made to you. We feel it's very important that when, when we undertake work like this that we do it with integrity. We have a commitment of integrity in our relationships with publishers, um, with the providers that we work with, with libraries, with the people who use our products. And we have to make sure that when we're working with an emerging field like AI, we work with those principles and those commitments in mind. So there are some very specific things that we are either doing or not doing in our work with generative AI that I want you to be aware of. And as you go back to your communities and your libraries and people may have questions, I want to be very clear how we're approaching this. I think it's maybe most important that when we talk about generative AI in a library setting that we're talking about something that involves trusted content and trusted data. This is one of the biggest concerns that we all have with tools like ChatGPT is it's looking at random stuff on the internet. Um, some of that stuff is not up to date. Some of that stuff comes from sources that we don't trust or that we wouldn't recommend our students use. When we're talking about generative AI with Clarivate products on our platforms, we're talking about trusted content and data. It's academic sources. It's been curated you know that it's something that you would be comfortable recommending and comfortable having people cite, for example, in an academic setting. There will be a lot of transparency, and we'll see this. We have some screenshots from the prototypes of these products and the work that we're doing. If the AI comes up with a summary of something, it will very clearly say that the summary was based on the following materials and you'll be able to look at the source documents directly. I think that's so important that we know it's not just sitting there making things up about a summary of an important topic. It, it's citing its sources, quite literally. It's showing you the receipts. It is also very important to understand that we are not training large language models using licensed content. We are using models that come from elsewhere, and they will work with content, but we're not using you know, your data or publisher data or anything like that to train um, large language models. And finally, global regulations on this topic are emerging. This is something that's very much in flux. I've heard of things coming out of a couple different jurisdictions that are maybe being debated or discussed, but not much has actually been nailed down. 
as global regulations emerge, we will, of course, comply with those. We are very um, aware of standards. I feel like I'm speaking a little too much as an ex-Libris person here. I'm, I'm outing myself. But um, we're really into standards, and we'll be complying with those and any legal regulations as those uh, come out. We have a long history of working in close collaboration with the community. We formed a customer advisory board on this topic about generative AI. We want to hear from you about how you're working with this, how you might work with this in the future, what your concerns are, what are you seeing when you talk with people, um, you know, patrons at the reference desk, what are you seeing when you go out and talk with faculty members, when you talk with, with, uh, with classes, with people like that. We want to hear from you about how we can work to make this the best tool possible that meets your needs. Please um, come to me after the session if this is something that you're interested in, in getting involved with. We're building this as we speak. It's very new. <clears throat> I also want to take a moment to talk a little bit um, to touch on the realm of the more technical. We're not getting super techy here, but just so that you understand how it works. We will have the products that you interact with and an end user might reasonably interact with that have a natural language search capability. So that will be in the future. Things like the Web of Science platform, the ProQuest platform, eBook Central, Primo Summon, anything that we build that eventually has a natural language search capability, that's the layer that you as the user would interact with. That sits on top of our generative AI platform that we're working on at the moment. That's what I was just speaking about, the kind of set of tools and capabilities that understands things like subject classification that can handle natural language processing, that helps you with suggestions and formulating queries. That is built on tools that um, we are getting from AI21, open AI tools, large language models, things like that. So that's the, the structure of these different layers that the products will work with. In terms of what you can expect for a timeline, what are these things? When will they be real? When can I use them? Are they actually imaginary? <coughs> They're not imaginary. They are very real. We have, at the moment, uh, in the fourth quarter of 2023, here where we are right now, the beta launch of the Web of Science AI Research Assistant. We'll see a little bit of a preview of that on uh, the next slide, in fact. Coming in the first quarter of next year, of 2024, the um, beta of the AI assistant on the ProQuest platform. At the moment, that works with ProQuest One literature. So you could go in and ask it questions about you know, Mark Twain or something like that, and it can give you pretty good answers to those questions. And then coming in the second quarter of next year, we will have the beta of the library discovery AI assistant. So that essentially is Primo, that you can interact with that in a conversational fashion. So that's a rough timeline of when those things will be around. And of course, with any of that, there is iterative development. We work in response to what we're seeing in the community, how people are using these things. We'll address your concerns and your needs as they arise. But that's the timeline for the initial launch of these products. This is the part that I think everybody is here for, that you've all been waiting for. We want to see what does it look like? What are these things actually doing? This is a sort of a small screenshot. I apologize for the tiny screenshot. But this is what we are working on for the Web of Science um, AI Research Assistant. It will do some specific things that we think will help people to interact with the Web of Science in productive ways. So you can approach it with a conversational discovery question. Um, show me articles on climate change. What are the most cited papers on microfluidics? So here's a story. I didn't know what that was. I said, what on earth is microfluidics? I'm not sure I'm even pronouncing it right. So I Googled it. And Google said, do you want to use AI in your search? We can present a summary of what this topic is. So I clicked on it, and then it said it wasn't working right now. I guess the AI was resting. <laughs> but um, I, I thought that was a very interesting circular experience that I had no idea what this thing was, and then Google wanted to help me. So hopefully uh, later on it will be up and running. Article summaries are something else that we are working on. I think it's especially important with the way that people use a tool like Web of Science, but this is 
an aspect of the AI platform that will appear across the products. We know from some research that we've done that a lot of users work with abstracts and summaries to understand, should I even read the whole article? Will I waste my time if I download this PDF? This is an important question. So you will be able to ask the Web of Science for a summary and maybe using some sort of indicator or identifier like a DOI. You can ask it direct questions and you'll be able to link to the search results um, and the result sets so that you can understand, again, transparency about where this is coming from, what are we providing you with. I want to now take a quick look at the ProQuest AI platform. Um, and I will say that a lot of what this is doing is actually very similar to the work that we're doing with Primo. So what you see here is, um, you know, I had slides in here for Primo. We took them out because they looked almost the same. So the capability will be um, pretty consistent. I think a consistent user experience across the platform is a very good thing. It makes it easier for users to use these tools. So it will combine the convenience of a tool like ChatGPT that students and other users already know how to use, but with academic integrity. As we've said, this is an important element of the, um, of the experience. It works on the ProQuest platform um, to get research, uh, to get results, to get recommendations, to access full text where that's <coughs> important, where that's necessary. At the moment, we're working with ProQuest One literature in our testing as we build this product. There will be additional collections that will come in the future, but that was a good set of uh, resources to start with. So this is a preview of the design, but let's break that down, what this looks like a little bit more in detail, what the user workflow might be through a system like this. I could um, prompt the, the system with a question. What's the relationship between Baudelaire and Paris? And then it gives me an answer that was generated by AI. We see the answer here. And then the research assistant clearly points me to the supporting works that were used to generate this summary. I can go in and quickly access via PDF or another mechanism the articles themselves. I can extend the summaries of the supporting works. And then I could ask another question. I could maybe ask a clarifying question. I could ask a question about a different topic entirely. But the interface is very clear, easy to use. And again, there's transparency there about what's being cited and what um, is used to generate the answers. We have a white paper about the impact of generative AI on libraries that we uh, encourage you to download. You can understand some of the thinking that goes into this work that we're doing at the moment. Um, and I really want to thank you for giving me 20 minutes of your time at the conference. I know this is always such a busy week for everybody. Um, it's great to see a, a standing room only crowd here, and I hope you all have a great week in Charleston. Thank you.